Welcome to Closer to Venus. I'm Johnny Burke, and today's guest is Robin Locke. She is an energy intuitive author and international speaker. And today we are going to talk about her latest book, The Greater Purpose, The Bridge Between the Physical and Non-Physical World and the Elders. Robin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me today. Now, for those of us who did not see your first episode, can you tell them a little bit about how you actually do bridge the physical and the non-physical world or what many people might call the invisible world? So what I'd say is really clearing the mind and stepping beyond what the mind would suggest and having a welcoming space to be able to connect to something beyond my physical knowingness. So it's just a matter of practice and developing a muscle. You get insights from the elders. Who are the elders and what do we need to know about them? So when I first started receiving insights and it had been going on for a while, I finally stopped and said, (laughs) what should I call you? And they said, may call us the elders. And I said, gosh, that sounds so formal. (laughs) Is there something a little bit less formal that I could address you with? And they said, no, this will do for a time. And in time, we might change that if you prefer. But right now, this is what we suggest you would refer to us as. Over time, I asked them how they would describe themselves. And they said, pure consciousness, infinite awareness. They are mostly those who have not embodied and have that 360 degree view of life without the mind or ego and have that all knowingness of expansiveness and the ability to understand what we're going through without the constraints of the physical body and the limitations that the mind imposes. So when you say you get insights, how did that start? Was there visuals or how did you come to recognize them? So I would sit in meditation each morning and I would try to clear my mind and I would pose questions and I would wait for my mind to become clear of the clutter of the ego or the mentalness and wait for an insight to come in. And I would write it down in a journal or on my laptop when I got (laughs) to where I could type faster than I could write. And I would record these. It just really became something that I did within my meditational practice before I went to my real job years ago. So it was something that I kind of developed over time. Now, you say the elders are those who have not incarnated, which I believe would be a point of distinction between the elders and spirit guides who apparently have incarnated. Is that correct? So there may be different understandings that different people have based on their experience. So I'll say that although the majority of the elders have not incarnated and the ones that I communicate with have not incarnated, there are those within that grouping because it's hundreds of spiritual beings, and they actually came on a mission here on earth, but they are of the persuasion of being that infinite awareness that that gives insights in a loving sort of way. The invisible entourage, which I think you're referencing, are those that I also believe most likely have not incarnated and are accessible when you start to ask questions and pose questions in prayer, in meditation, and contemplation, where you're looking for an answer and you have the means of understanding the answer that they're giving. The elders are not my invisible entourage. That's a different category or grouping of beings that are with one. So you have anywhere from five to seven in the entourage with you at all times. Speaking of spirit guides, some can be loved ones who have passed on. It does get a bit confusing, though, doesn't it? There's different categories of these light beings, for lack of a better description. Would you agree? Yes. And I would say that it's all a matter of interpretation. So imagine that you're a guide for an individual. You're a spiritual being guide that is trying to communicate and give insights. And now someone has passed that is a loved one that you want to communicate with. They've been referred to, and we did talk about this the last time, as the great mimickers. It's not meant as a means of deceiving. It's meant as a means of being able to provide insights in a way that is receptive, that one is receptive to receive. So I don't say that they are not joining the group. That's not my understanding, but it could be another's understanding. But also consider that now that you're searching they have the means to give an answer because they're with you from embodiment to embodiment. 
and they're with you during the in-between time. So they're your resource. When you give an opening to allow them to communicate, perhaps they want to take that to help the live stream that they serve. Do you think it's true that we can communicate with our past loved ones through a spirit guide? Do you believe that's possible? Absolutely. All you have to do is focus on their energy. You know, we're energy <laughs> at the baseline consideration. And so when a loved one passes, I do it all the time. When I think about my dad or grandfather or someone that is dear, I just focus upon them until I feel their energy. And then I send them a message of love. And I feel that reciprocated. It's as simple as that. I believe you can connect at any point and any time. You're never separated. It's the mind that believes of the separation. So we're never separated which means I can think of my mom or any number of people that I know that have passed, they will acknowledge it. They will feel it. It's not my imagination, right? Right. And the thing I would say that would be key to that process is that you always begin from the heart space and that you always begin from a centered space of love and that you ask to be anchored through light and love in the process. Then you just focus upon them until you feel their energy. It doesn't take very long. And then you say what you want to say and allow that feeling to be returned because everything at the end of the day is energy. And so you're just sending them an energetic kiss. Energetic kiss. That sounds like a <laughs> band name. As a matter of fact, I think that is a band. I think they're from Brooklyn. More on that later. A few moments ago, you had mentioned something about the elders and a mission that they have. Is that related to what Dolores Cannon talked about in her books, or is that something completely different? You'll have to share with me what Dolores shared in her books. I pretty much stay true to my books so that I don't mix messages. We don't really have time to go into all the details of the book. The gist of it is they are light beings that were reincarnated to come back on a mission. It sounds similar to what you're describing with the elders. They might be similar beings. They might be the same beings. Tell us about their mission. What I'll say is that the elders were in another system of worlds, and they heard about spiritual essence being trapped in human form, and that they had lost their way back home. They had lost their awareness of why they were where they were. And so they came on a mission to this planetary system to allow a remembering, to allow more than what we have today. So they're introducing more truths, more understandings, and it's simply that the mind needs to not limit what is understood, but they came from another system of worlds to allow remembering within humanity for those who, quite frankly, have been incarnating for quite a long time. So those that have been incarnating for a while seem to have lost their purpose or did not remember? Lost their remembering of why they are here. If you feel like you have a purpose, then you have a purpose. But I've been told that not everyone has a purpose. So it's that inner awareness that you have a purpose. You want to know what it is because, quite frankly, you were spiritual essence. Or spiritual essence heard about this earth platform where you could understand something when you don't have the feeling ability while in spiritual form. And so in order to understand what love truly is, how do you know what love is unless you know what love is not? And so they chose to enter into an agreement to come into physical form. They donned a, what they call a space suit, like an astronaut suit, to be able to breathe in the environment, to be able to walk and talk and do all the things that you would do to have this experience so that when they left this earth plane, this journey, this experience, then they would understand what love truly is. So those who have forgotten what their objective was to be here in the first place, perhaps have not enacted or understood that purpose. They've forgotten their objective, their mission, their reason for being in this earth space. And so what the elders seek to do is to remind so that then they can enact what they came here to understand and move beyond this earth experience in the rounds of reincarnation, which will continue until they satisfy the agreement that they entered into to incarnate here. 
Now, you mentioned that the elders have been here. Do you know approximately how long ago in terms of Earth time? They don't know time. They don't. Time does not exist there. But what they shared in the Awaken book, which launched recently, the first chapter is my soul's first personalities, my first embodiment, because we're all connected. And it was beyond and earlier than recorded time. It was a more advanced time than today. What they shared with me most recently is we have had a higher evolution that has devolved and now is evolving in a higher way now, but not certainly anywhere near the higher evolution that we once were. Now, that seems to imply that we did have an advanced civilization here, not just in terms of technology, but in terms of consciousness. I think they always talk in terms of consciousness. I received an update the other day in how to incorporate the means of manifestation in with universal love, which was something that was done in this more highly evolved time. And it was the time they called the wanting, the wanting time. So today you donate to a charity to help those who are a part of that charity who receive support from that charity. This is the means to create a manifestation energy mixed with universal love that actually buoys up a whole community, individuals within that community, you you direct that energy toward, and it is an elixir, more or less. I'd ask for a new insight because a lot of times I feel like we're giving the same update and I wanted something more. So this was in response to my request to have something more to be given, and it is the development of this energy elixir. And it's going to be released on, um, so it will be on my YouTube channel. In your experience with the elders, in your insights, sound like downloads. It's almost like you get a firmware update or something. Have they given you any kind of knowledge of ancient civilizations? They do, and they have. They've given me three. One was a lost civilization. One was a story from a long time ago. It's fun to receive those because they give kernels of insights within each of them. You have to really listen. I've started doing blog posts where it's not from the elders, but from me explaining what the elders are giving because sometimes they give it in such an esoteric way that you may miss the message. So what I'm trying to do now is to start the blog post with something from me and then link it to the YouTube that will come out that same day. So they have mentioned ancient or lost civilizations. Can you give us a hint of what that lost civilization was or if there was more than one? They don't give particulars. They give insights within the civilization that they discuss. It's not like they describe it. But what I know for sure is that I had an embodiment after my initial one that I worked in technology and it was a very advanced time. But apparently my personality pushed against what was customary at the time, tried to introduce something that was before its time or not acceptable. It's caused subsequent embodiments with technology to have technology issues. I was doing something the other day with the launch and it was almost like a sack was put over my head. And I did some work on that this morning because I believe that that was some experience that was held in that embodiment. So what I believe for sure is the value of knowing earlier embodiments is to understand limitations that we may hold in this lifetime today. Now, when you say you worked in technology, that seems to be, that took place in a period before recorded time here on earth. Was it that long ago? Yes. I'm curious, how many thousands of years ago was that? They don't give time. They don't recognize time. In the Awaken book, they talk about parallel universe and time travel and all sorts of uniquenesses. And they say time does exist concurrently. So if you can almost imagine that some of this is going on concurrent to this one, but it was in a very different time. So it's the time factor is something that we feel very tangibly here because we're physical. But when you're not physical and it's just energy, it's different. It is a mind bender. It is a mind bender, isn't it? (laughs) It is. And I've heard that there is no time. 
everything exists at once. I had someone on the show recently, I believe it was Holly Duckworth, and she was talking about an experience where Dolores Cannon, who was her teacher and her mentor, had a discussion across time with Nostradamus. And I think that is just incredibly cool, but I'm thinking, okay, so she had a discussion with Nostradamus back in whatever century that was. So you believe time travel is actually possible? I don't focus on a lot of this. I just know what they have told me, and I trust the elders. So they're from the energy of love, and my purpose is service. And so truth is my life purpose, because we don't talk about the life purpose. We talk about the original purpose, which is the bigger, more vast purpose or greater purpose. There is so much more than I think we can individually conceptualize. They said the mind is like a computer and it hasn't been programmed for spiritual objectives. And so I don't limit any of that with my limited knowledge because I don't believe we could mentally handle what really is because we'd just be blown out of the water. So most give little kernels that we can kind of get around and digest. I think I know 1% of 1% of 1%, but I don't know by any stretch all that there is. So in other words, trying to really understand the concept of time or no time is probably beyond our comprehension in this current incarnation. Eventually, when we cross over, hopefully then we'll get it. So what I will say, when we pass, we hold the same belief system that we hold now. So if you believe something that's partially true but not fully true, you'll be reinforced by everything that you currently believe. Your belief system travels with you to that in-between transitory time. They've shared that in The Greater Purpose. So if you believe something that is kind of right, but not completely right, it will be reinforced. And then you'll plan your next life using what they call faulty material, not complete information. So there's no teacher there giving you the correct answers to the test is what you're saying. No, because what universe says is you have free will. And so if you wanted to know more, you would have looked for more in this lifetime. It would be a diminishment of your free will election to tell you that what you believe is not so at that point in time. Does that make sense? Even with my earth brain, I think I can understand that. You've mentioned the in-between space and agreements I believe this is from the book. The remembrance will enable our ability to stop the rounds of incarnation and complete the agreement we set up. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So The Greater Purpose is a three-purpose trilogy book set that is combined into one book. And the second book in the set is called The Original Purpose. And in that, it talks about the transitory time and it talks about that in-between time Mm -hmm. and the remembrances and all of those details. In the third book, which is the most recent, Enact Your Purpose, it talks about how you are not your mind, how you are separate from that. It gives the analogy of you donning a spacesuit to be in this lifetime today. And so all of this melds together to give you a more definitive understanding of what all of this is about. This is where they compare the mind to and all of this to a computer and say that oftentimes the computer operator is watching the computer as the computer decides what it wants to do. So we need to become that conscious awareness where we take back the decision making and recognize that the mind will lead us off track oftentimes because it's like the teenager without the curfew. (laughs) (laughs) Teenager without the curfew. What a lot of us have heard about the in-between space, life between lives, and I think was Michael Newton in his books talked about this quite a bit. Is this the place where we make soul agreements with the soul family? I've been told it's almost like casting a movie. Do you find the same thing or is it a little bit different than that? It's very similar to that. When Spiritual Essence wanted to have this experience, they had to encapsulate into a soul. So the soul isn't necessary, and that's why someone once referred to the elders as departed souls, and the elders responded that you may not know the energy in which you're you're speaking to, because they are not departed souls. 
They didn't mean it in an insulting way, but they meant it that you're not understanding the energy in which you're communicating. And so departed souls are often those that want to come back and give a message. They didn't have a complete life or they want to share more or they weren't, or they're not ready, or whatever the issue is, but that's not this. So within this experience and the transitory time, there is the faulty material that we're basing our next incarnation. So imagine today there is a lot of unrest within, let's say, our population. The people that are fueling some of that feel very empowered and correct and right in what they're doing. So imagine that you're in a space and you believe whatever is believed, and now you're given reinforcement of that faulty belief system. And you formulate your next life based on those faulty beliefs. You can almost see it in the world today. One of the things I could never quite understand when we talk about karma, we are responsible for our behavior, our acts, what we do here on earth. If you take a scene where this group starts making decisions like, in my next incarnation, you're going to be my mom, you're going to be my dad, you're going to be the friend that betrays me, you're going to be the girl that breaks my heart, whatever that is. They come down here, right? And some people have decided to play the bad guy. Do you think it's true that once they go back to that in-between space, they are going to feel what they have made others feel. Yes and no. So what I believe is that when you go into that in-between space, sometimes you need a villain because you want to experience, and they're helping you experience that thing by taking on that role. What I've been told about the review process is that it's not an in-depth review it's snippets. It's like little components. It gives the individual the overall flavor of the lifetime because the intention isn't to make one feel bad or feel in a lower space. The intention is to review and give an assessment, but in a space of love. It's always from a space of love. So the other thing that you mentioned was about the agreement. I believe that the agreement is the thing that brings you into embodiment the first time. I don't know that the agreement is reinforced in the in-between times because what I believe happens is the original incarnation is where you have the closest ability to enact your original purpose for entering into physical form as different incarnations occur, there is less and less and less of a remembrance, not only of the original purpose, but of the divine lineage from which you came. So there is that forgetfulness that we are in now. You can imagine that many have been incarnating before recorded history. That would mean that there is a great diminishment of understanding and of remembering and of recall. And there haven't been books that directly go to the steps that need to be done so that an individual can reconnect to why they are here and what they can do to move out of the rounds of incarnation because karma has been misinterpreted by mankind or by whoever wrote some of the definitions. The man-made inference is that you have to atone and make right past indiscretions. Elders have said, if you choose to do that through your free will election, you may be coming here for a very long time. But the true meaning of karma is to make whole. That's a very interesting point you just made. So in other words, just so we all understand this, the elders have basically told you, if we understand karma as atonement, we're going to be coming back again, again, and again. If we believe it and accept it. If we embrace it, it's free will. I believe that. I wanted to make right all my wrongs. I wanted to atone for everything that I had done. And they said, it's not like that. This space is meant to be where you make mistakes because the mistakes make you look a different direction. So don't try to make right what need not be perfect. You came for perfection. Now you're in a space of imperfection and the imperfection is needed to show you a different direction, a different path, and to make a different choice. Going back to the in-between space in the soul group, the casting, for lack of a better description, is done in such a way that the group learns as a whole, depending on what role you're supposed to play, good or bad, that the objective is not just for you to learn, it's for the entire group to learn. Does that make sense? 
It does, and I don't know that I have heard it that way. Everything I've heard is more individual, and you need different players to come in. It discusses this in the Awakened book, where it talks about needing antagonists and needing adversarial components in your storyline. When you recognize that many of the antagonists within your storyline are merely a reflection of the one who doesn't like them, when you recognize that there are people that you hear all the time that people don't like in politics, and they really almost rub them in a visceral way, like it's a deep angst that they feel. I always will ask when I hear that, well, what is it that you don't like about them? If you can understand that the thing that often people don't like is the very thing that they embrace. And no one likes to see someone doing something that they don't like themselves doing. So it's a mirror image. And once we recognize that a lot of those things that we see as bad are simply reflections of us and we see the gift in what was given and we can look at the experience differently And then we may not feel that way toward that individual anymore. They were simply needed to show us what we couldn't see within ourselves. I do like that. And it reminds me of what a friend of mine told me recently. He said, well, I listened to your podcast and all these different episodes. And I really like how you dive into the in-between space and try to make sense of it. Could it be that if one were to look at his or her surroundings, instead of saying, this person's mean, this guy's a dick, this girl's a bitch, or whatever, (laughs) merely look at them as they're playing a role. That's what they were directed to do. That's what they signed up for. That's what I signed up for. That means I don't have to judge them. It's not good or bad. It's just experience. So the elders have said judgment is self-judgment. So whatever you judge the other person to be, how would you know what that person does really? How do you know what they think? We don't. But you know what you think, and we know what you know. And so when you judge, it is the realization that you see that component in yourself. What they recommend, I think it's in Chapter 9 of Awaken, that you have a journal, and you list all the characteristics about this individual, and you go through a process so that you can see and then release what was unseen before. It's all meant to be a journey. It's all self-discovery. Anytime something doesn't happen, it's not because of them. It's because of the energy that we individually keep. So when our energy shifts, we broadcast energy differently. That energy goes out and gathers more of its kind before returning back to you. So when you're at a different energetic state, then you're going to get a different energy in return. Once you have that realization, these people won't bother you in the same way that they used to, and they'll either exit your life or you'll see them and you don't care in the same way that you did before, or what they say will flow over and through you and you'll chuckle at it and think it's absurd. So that's where the transformation happens because now you've freed yourself from the mental bonds that you had before because what the mind interjects is, most of the time, factually incorrect. Does that have anything to do with what you describe as the mind being separate from us? The mind is not us. Yes, and they explain that very eloquently. And I don't know if we have time, but it's a great explanation. And I never understood it fully, but I do now. Well, we might have another installment because it seems like we do have a little bit more work to do on this. Robin, thanks for coming back onto the show. In the meantime, I believe the best way to find out more about you and your books is at advancedenergetics.org. Yes. Excellent. Okay, I will put that in the show notes and the transcript as well. You've been listening to Closer to Venus. I'm Johnny Burke. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing. For more info, please go to closertovenus.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.